Hello. As we saw in the previous episode, the Hellfire Club moved from Mednam Abbey to West Wickham Caves either in the late 1750s or the early 1760s. The reason for this uncertainty is firstly, because I said very few records remain, and secondly, because it seems to have been a gradual process. There was a period in which both venues were being used. Once the move took place, it was business as usual, although perhaps by this time membership was somewhat diminished. I say this for two reasons. First, the space in the caves was rather limited, and it's hard to understand how much space was needed at Mednam Abbey, because as you can see, it is now a private house and has been extensively, well, extended. We don't know if all the members were always present. Second, by this time, many of the members were getting a bit old for that sort of thing and probably saw the opportunity to share a bed with a young lady as more of a chance to have a lie down than anything else. Here you can see the main hall in the caves where feasts and some ceremonies took place. The alcoves around the hall could be curtained off and they each contained a bed and where the monks retired to to spend some time with the nuns. I don't think I need to draw you a picture. The caves start about 200 feet below the top of the hill and extend for about a quarter of a mile over 400 metres and the banqueting hall is being just over halfway along its length. As you walk along the passengers, you're going downhill all the time. Beyond the banqueting hall, there is a bridge which crosses an underground stream, which, being excavated by the classically educated Dashwood, is called the River Styx. When I first visited this site many years ago, it was possible to reach over the parapet of the bridge and touch the water. In the modern British bureaucratic Kildur-Joy obsession with health and safety, this has meant that you can see it's difficult to even see the water these days. Just over the bridge, we come to the inner temple where it is believed most of the secret ceremonies took place. We discuss what they got up to in the previous episode. How they did this in the cold conditions down here, I do not know. But anyway, a lot of prominent people in British society were members of this notorious club. Let me give you some of the examples of them. The Earl of Sandwich, who I mentioned in the second episode, was Dashwood's right-hand man and effectively executive officer of the club, probably one of the most notorious rakes of his day. It is also said that he was one of the most disliked men in England, but because of his wealth and his friendship with the future King George III, most people didn't express their dislike too loudly. He was also an addictive gambler and often played cards for 24 hours at a stretch, refusing to leave the table. The story goes that on one occasion, when he was hungry, he ordered a servant to place a piece of beef between two slices of bread and bring it to him so that he could eat without interrupting the game. It is said that the word sandwich comes from this. The other sandwich was a toy, which at that time meant a, f a friend of the royal house. When the Whig party was defeated in the election in, during the Seven Years' War, he was invited to become the first Lord of the Admiralty, the head of the British Navy. The Sandwich Isles in the Pacific were discovered during his term in office and named after him. It is said that unusually in an age when most political appointees did very little work, that he threw the same feverish en en energy into his job at the Admiralty as he threw into the production of young girls and the wives of other aristocrats, but with far less success. Most contemporaries claim that his period as First Lord of the Admiralty was marked by an unprecedented level of incompetence. This was partially mitigated by that age-old strategy used by subordinates of ignoring his instructions. One more thing is reliably recorded that he fought over 20 duels, mainly against outraged husbands and fathers. Lord Bude, another king's friend, became Prime Minister under George III. Like Sandwich, he opposed any progressive and democratic policies, including any compromise with the American colonists in their desire for greater representation. He seduced Princess Augusta, the wife of Frederick, Prince of Wales, and the mother of the future George III. Frederick, Prince of Wales, died before becoming the king. So, 
When George II died in 1760, he was succeeded by George III, his grandson. Lord Bude had considerable influence over the young king, who is said to have been the least intelligent monarch ever to sit on the British throne. Bude once said to the young king, remember, you are king and you must be ruthless. One of George's attempts to follow this advice resulted in the American Revolution. Bude never showed much interest either in the aesthetic or the black magic side of the club. However, I'm sure he made full use of the cellar and the nuns. Thomas Potter was son of the Archbishop of Canterbury and probably one of the most unpleasant members of the group. His father, the Archbishop, once gave him £100,000, millions in today's money, which he squandered on drink and women in a very short time. It's a matter of opinion whether you think this is money well spent or not. You decide. After finishing this fortune his father had given him, he married a wealthy woman and spent her money as well. He also beat her to death but got away with it. A monster in any age. He took the Satanist aspect of the club very seriously and wrote psalms for the Black Mass and frequently served as chief priests at the altar. He was also a member of Parliament. Henry Vatisant was the ex-governor of the Presidency of Bengal and he made his fortune in India before returning to the UK and he brought exotic animals back with him, one of which was the baboon used by John Wilkes in the joke that he played that I described in the previous episode. Chevalier Dion, a quick word about Chevalier Dion here, although he was not one of the major members, he was certainly one of the weirdest. No one is really sure whether he was a man or a woman. He dressed as both and he would attend meetings as one of the nuns and then reappear later dressed as a man. He was a famous swordsman and fought many duels and often killed people who dared to ask him about his real gender. At one time, bets as to his true gender had risen so high, amounting to over six million in today's money, that Chevalier was in danger of being kidnapped by heavy bettors so that his sex could be determined by force. After being assaulted several times by armed gangs, he agreed to allow a jury of respectable matrons to examine him. They returned a verdict of uncertain. John Wilkes. At the height of the Hellfire Club's power, when it was based in Medlam Abbey, its members were virtually running the country, and the vast majority of the senior members were Tories, which at that time meant the King's friends. The King by now being George III, who, as one commentator mentioned, was a person who couldn't find his own bottom with both hands. There was one prominent member who was not part of this group, and this is the man we heard about at the beginning of the last episode, John Wilkes. Unlike other members of the club, he was not from the nobility and was certainly not one of their lackeys. Indeed, he came from quite humble origins and was a great believer in the rights of man. He was also a member of parliament and an editor of the North Britain, a newspaper that was considered seditious by many members of the establishment and downright treasonous by the king. One wit wondered if the king was actually able to spell the word treasonous, but that's another story. The most famous issue of the North Britain was the 45th, published in 1763. It contained a scathing attack on King George III and the government's policies. This issue led to Wilkes being arrested for seditious libel. He was quite skinny, and indeed, opponents in duels, of which he fought a considerable number, complained that he couldn't, they couldn't see him when he turned sideways. He was also said to be phenomenally ugly with a tis twisted mouth and protruding jaw. He had little patience with the aristocracy and the sycophantic behaviour towards the king. He also considered the beliefs of Satanism beneath contempt, as we can see from the prank I described in the last episode. Wilkes was distrusted by, most, distrusted by most members of the Hellfire Club, but Dashwood liked him and continued to promote his interests. John Wilkes is indeed such a complex character that he could be the subject of a video all by himself. During the dispute between the American colonist representatives and the British government, Wilkes fiercely promoted the interests of the Americans in Parliament. Indeed, to this day, you can find see places in the United States which are said to commemorate John Wilkes. 
His name, for some time, was also used as a middle name for many American citizens. John Wilkes Booth, who assassinated President Lincoln 100 years later, is one unfortunate example. Sir Francis Dashwood and Benjamin Franklin had been in correspondence before Benjamin Franklin arrived in Britain as a delegate of the colonists. His purpose was to try to find a deal with the British government. And although Dashwood was a Tory, which at that time meant a supporter of the monarchy, he discovered that he had a great deal in common with Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin visited West Wickham and almost certainly took part in some of the activities in the West Wickham caves. Of course, concrete evidence is hard to find, and people who revere Benjamin Franklin as a founding father of the American Republic, quite rightly, in my opinion, might feel offended by the idea that he was associated with such a debauched and libertine club. We have to remember that Benjamin Franklin, like everybody else in this story, was a product of his age, which meant that for an English gentleman and its American leaders, to all intents and purposes, were indistinguishable from any other English gentleman, would naturally have indulged in the vices of that age. We cannot judge people of that age by the standards of the 21st century. That's a very slippery slope. Benjamin Franklin's association with the Hellfire Club, whatever it was, doesn't distract, detract at all from his other great achievements. In the early 1760s, and I apologise for not being more precise, because it's really difficult to find reliable dates, the club began to decline and would eventually be dissolved. Why did the Hellfire Club decline? Some say it's possibly due to Dashwood's appointment as Chancellor of the Exchequer. Dashwood's short period as Chancellor of the Exchequer, which for my friends outside Britain is the second most powerful political position in the country, Nowadays, the Chancellor of the Exchequer is, has the official residence at number 11 Downing Street and deals with the budgets of every single government department. In any case, Dashwood was getting old and I suspect he no longer had the appetite for all of the activities that had previously taken up so much of his life. The Dashwood family are still present in West Wickham and the caves and the estate are managed by the National Trust and both well worth visiting. It's incredible to think that this beautiful area was one effective, once effectively the private kingdom of Sir Francis. I recommend walking around West Wickham and visiting the caves, also visiting the Church of St Lawrence on the top of the hill under which the caves were excavated. There is a legend that a tunnel exists from the caves through the hill and into the church, but this is just a legend. If you look at the top of the church tower, you can see a golden ball. Inside this ball there is a table and it's said that some members of the club dined at this table on certain occasions. I'm informed that there is space for only about six people, and for me it seems very uncomfortable and stuffy. Thank you for watching this episode. This is the story of a place that I've known for many, many years, and I hope your interest will be stimulated by this video. I have left a reference to books on the subject in the description, and I absolutely recommend visiting these places. If you're a British resident, you have no excuse. Anyway, if you've enjoyed this, uh, this series, please click the like and subscribe buttons and the notifications and share it with your friends. Bye for now. See you next time.